is there such a thing as the perfect rose? You have to fall in love with the rose. I, I mean, I, for me, it's the Comte de Chambord. Maybe because it's a male, I don't know. The perfect rose is the one I haven't made yet because that one's perfect. I have worshipped at the altar of David Austin for five years now, and the rose that I first encountered that got me into this activity is Tamora. The voluptuousness of the bloom, the sensuousness of the smell, the deep apricot is like nothing else on this planet. They're all wonderful. They're like children. How can you pick a favorite child? Okay. I've been writing and illustrating books on plants for about 20 years or more. For me, it's a sort of learning process. I'm an amateur gardener. I garden here in Eccleston Square, where, in fact, I've built up over time a collection of more than 200 different roses. I'm crazy about them. When I started these programs, I wanted to find out more about these extraordinary plants. The deeper I delved into their history, their mythology and their development, the more complex and absorbing it became. I hoped I could disentangle the story by finding the key roses. But what were they? I began my quest by seeking out the most ancient remains of roses ever to be found. The oldest known evidence of roses is fossil evidence. And I've come here to Colorado to look at the fossils that are found here. And they certainly have magnificent fossils. Look at these trees. I'm here at the Florissant National Monument. And I'm going to talk to a man from the Natural History Museum of Denver, Kirk Johnson. This is what we call the big tree for obvious reasons. It's gigantic, isn't it? It's a sequoia. What kind of date is that? The upper um, ledge above us is a radiometric date of 35 million years. Kirk told me this whole area had once been a primeval forest, which was then submerged in a gigantic lake. Why don't we take a look at this hill over here? But this shows the great masses of mud and stuff that came down, does it? Yeah, you can see the actual mud flow that capped off the lake sediments. And if you crawl underneath here and look, you can actually see the layers. I knew I was going to end up under a rock somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> this is the, um, the bottom of the mud flow that came in and actually buried the lake. And what you see here are the layers of the lake bed. These flat laminated beds are actually the Layers very of clearly exposed, yeah, isn't it? You can exactly. See. And this is the stuff you find the fossils in. Yeah, it's these little lake beds that have the uh, fossils. You can see there are pieces of these things lying around, these little little chunks like this. And this is the paper shale I mentioned to you. You can see it's just like <laughs> tiny little pages. Just like it paper. Just like paper. It's like reading the book of the earth when you split these things apart because you have these wonderful fossils on the pages of the rock and you split them apart. I'm a very good archivist here. Let's see. Oh, here, this is a bit of a stem, it looks like. Whether it's rose or not, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll never know. Yeah. But may I have a look at the one you bought to show me? I did bring one along to show you. Here, let's get it in the pocket here. Carefully packed. Straight from the Smithsonian. OK. Oh, it's a perfectly preserved rose leaf, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And you can clearly see the, the details of the leaf. The detailed venation of the uh, leaf, leaves and the teeth are what you would find in very similar to a modern rose. The rose family goes back further into the geologic record. But this, the genus Rosa mm -hmm. makes its first appearance in. I had completed the first stage of my quest and found that 35 million years ago, 
roses like this started appearing all over the northern hemisphere. But how did different species start to interbreed? I went to see my friend, the botanist Martin Ricks. Yes, you can imagine two different species of roses coming together in an area of transitional climate, rather like the Mediterranean hills, where you've got the dry Central Asian flora meeting the subtropical Himalayan flora. Oh, I see, yes. And a rose could live on a dry south-facing slope um, near a rose which prefers a damp, cool north-facing slope and a bee f flying ac ac across and pollinating them. And bingo, you've got your first uh, hybrid uh, rose. Hybrid, yes, yes, terrific. And you, you can imagine that happening between Gallica from the plateau of central Turkey and Phoenicia from the Mediterranean coast with the early damask rose. Martin's a compulsive plant hunter. I was thrilled when he suggested my next step should be to join him on an expedition to Turkey to try and find Rosa Phoenicia. But I was by myself when I made my first discovery. This looks really an interesting looking rose. This rose has got to be either Phoenicia or, even more rare and more interesting, it could be Mushata. What I'm going to do now is get a nice piece and press it and show it to Martin Ricks tonight and see if he can identify it. dog rose at first and then the leaves no. are hairy look at that yes look at the big teeth i think yeah. that's i think that's rose phoenicia do you but these big teeth are characteristic i was looking at it up in the flora before we left yeah that's really exciting it's just in style isn't it good health it is where do you find that it's a real thing martin had told me that there were very few records as to where rosa phoenicia was to be found this rose has hardly ever been collected before and isn't even in cultivation. Roger! Come and look here! But next day it was Martin's turn. Rose finish here again. See, look at the same leaves. Hairy leaves. Hairy leaves. Not soft. It, yes, look, it's got the long leafy sepals, like a damask. Yes, you can see them on the bird line. Yes. Martin found his Rosa Phoenicia amongst the remains of the ancient port of Sidae. The classical ruins were themselves another clue in the story of the rose. In Greek mythology, the goddess of love, Aphrodite, was born out of sea foam. As she rose out of the sea, the foam turned to white roses. Why the rose of all the flowers should become the symbol of love, I've no idea. But the single wild roses are very delicate things that come out and bloom and die and drop in one day. And in contrast to that sort of simple beauty and the scent of the lovely wild flower, 
you've got the nasty, vicious thorns giving you the sort of tragic element, perhaps, of love. The interesting thing is what the rose might have been. It might have been a white dog rose or even the wild white Phoenicia rose, or perhaps it was a very early alba, a semi-double alba or even a single alba. Rosa alba is an ancient group dating back to classical times. It arose probably as a natural hybrid between Rosa canina, the wild dog rose, and Rosa damascena. They're white, or sometimes rather pale pink, with this blue foliage and make very fine garden plants. This one's Rosa alba semi-plena, meaning semi-double. White roses represented innocence and virginity. Red roses, the coming of age. In mythology, the story of the creation of the red rose is that Aphrodite ran to rescue her beloved Adonis, who was fighting with a boar, and she caught her thigh on a rose bush. A drop of blood fell from her thigh onto a white rose, and it turned into a red rose. These ancient myths show me the tremendous hold the rose had on the imagination of our ancestors. Here in the British Museum, I'm coming to find out about the first clues to man's involvement with the rose. What usually happens when people are looking for the first evidence for anything, they come to us, because as far as we know, writing started in Mesopotamia, and therefore uh, the first record of things is often available from clay tablets. And there's a lot of evidence to do with plants. At what actual period does that come from? Documents which really help us to identify ancient plant names uh, don't really come in before uh, the first millennium. That's after 1000 BC. Now, we have in the treasures in this museum um, a large group of tablets from the Royal Library of Assyria, uh, which was collected by King Ashurbanipal in the 7th century. There's a word Amurudinu in Babylonian, which uh, this Russian scholar has argued that um, th this is a word for wild rose or rose. And his evidence is partly derived from literary compositions where people refer to the plant for an image. And the most famous example is uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh. And in, uh, in this um, story, they are in pursuit of um, the, the plant which will confer um, eternal life. And when they find this plant, uh, they say, um, like an Amarudinu, um, its uh, thorns will prick your hand. And you know from this, obviously, that it was an attractive plant, that it was prickly and, and, and so forth. Yes. And if you put this all together, yes. you can argue that uh, um, this might indeed be the word for rose. And which is the actual word? Well, let's see if I can find it. It's here. It is written, Amur Dinu. Yes. Uh, now I've got a little surprise for you. I brought a piece of clay and I'm going to ask you if you could possibly write the word rose for us. <laughs> in yes. Babylonian? Will with, it be in Babylonian? In Babylonian, yes, with pleasure. OK, pass it over here, then. Let's move this out of the way. That's a very fine tablet. Right, what can we use? Um, you realise, of course, that uh, they wrote tablets with cut reeds as a stylus in Mesopotamia. Um, I'm going to have to use a ruler. Yes. Uh, they also had rulers, but not this kind. Um, here we go. It's in four syllables. Ah. No. I don't know whether King Ashurbanipal would have employed me as one of his calligraphers, but I've done my best for you. But the Romans didn't just write about roses. They grew them in vast quantities. In fact, as with other entertainments, they went right over the top. Heliogabalus, a late Roman emperor, when he had his inaugural feast at the age of 14, locked all the doors and poured roses over the poor people he'd invited.
Something like eight of them were actually suffocated before the end of the feast. But what were the roses they used and how did they manage to produce petals in such vast quantities? The first evidence of gardening I had been able to find was Roman. Ovid wrote about it. Virgil actually mentions taking cuttings. The natives transplant their roses in order to improve them, I read in Pliny. The Romans certainly knew about pruning. They advocated pruning roses as late as March to get a really late flowering. But what they did to bring on the early flowering is even more interesting. They planted them in a trench and then watered them twice a day with hot water to make the flowers come sooner. I was to track down my next lead at an ancient ruined port on the coast of southern Turkey. We know that the Romans had many different kinds of roses. They grew damasks, gallicas, autumn damasks, and probably albers as well. Roses in classical times were used as symbols and for decoration, presumably. But they weren't just used for that. They were used in the production of a rose oil. We know from Homer, writing in the 9th century, that rose oil was used to anoint the body of Hector. I had made landfall by the ruins of a once enormously wealthy city-state, whose economy had been based on the perfume trade. The city of Phasalis was established by the islanders of Rhodes in 690 BC. They were passionate rose lovers. On the back of their coin, they even had the symbol, the rose. Money was of great concern to the Phasalians. There's an ancient saying, never lend a Phasalian money. The next day, he'll remember it as a gift. Maybe it was the Fasalians' interest in money that led them to develop a rose that, it was said, flowered all year. It can't have done, really. But perhaps it was the twice-flowered damask, the autumn damask. By Roman times, we certainly know this was grown in great quantities down at Paestum. Anyway, the roses that they grew for their flower industry and the petals were probably grown way up here in the mountains. I found that today they grew the roses for attar of roses, a hundred miles inland, up on the plains near Esparta. I was intoxicated by the wonderful scent that pervades the rose fields and was told that the flowers had to be picked before the precious oil was evaporated by the heat of the sun. This is the rose Kazanlik, Trigenti Petla, which apparently means 30 petals, and I counted them, and it really does have 30 petals. It's a damask. The scented damasks are a very ancient group of roses. This, I suppose, is the most important one of them all, the perfumer's rose. Kazanlik looks as if it might have been bred from a cross between the Apothecary's rose, Rosa Gallica officinalis, and the wild Rosa Phoenicia that Martin and I had found near the coast. The sacks of roses are sold to a cooperative factory where the rose oil is made. Unlike the rose of Fasalis, Cassanlik only flowers for about one month a year. It takes as much as four kilos of rose petals to make one gram of rose oil. I can't believe that the ancient Greeks and Romans would have had the technology for distillation. I suspect their oil was made by steeping rose petals in olive oil. 
Their dead were often anointed with rose oil before being buried. Was rose oil thought to be the elixir of life? But I was to find out about ancient graves that held yet more rose secrets. William Flinders Petrie, perhaps the greatest archaeologist of all time. Before him, it was said, archaeologists worked with dynamite. After he'd finished his work, they worked with paintbrushes. This little museum, the Petrie Museum, part of University College London, houses most of his finds. But I'm coming here on the quest for the rose. A man visiting Petrie once, I think it was in Egypt where he was working, was told he's over there. And when he went to find him, he found him up to his neck in water, holding an umbrella to keep at bay 120 degrees of heat, just like a buffalo. In 1888, Petrie was excavating in Egypt at Hawara. He was looking at tombs dating from the Roman period, about the second century AD. When they opened up the tombs, they found that the mummies had beautiful portrait heads done in wax, the encaustic portraits. They caused an enormous stir when they were exhibited in London at the time. Apart from that, there was something that really excited botanists. They found fragments of plant remnants. And with Petrie's great attention to detail, he preserved them. Botanists examined them and were very excited by what they found. This box contains twigs of myrtle, portions of a wreath composed of blue Egyptian water lilies, and a wreath composed of petals of roses. This makes it, apart from the fossilized evidence, the earliest known rose in existence. It's Rosa Sancta, the Holy Rose of Abyssinia. Now, unfortunately, it's changed its name to Rosa Ricardii, but still. In Britain, we did not start cultivating roses until the Middle Ages, by which time they were to be found in the gardens of religious foundations, where they were grown as medicinal plants. Monastery gardens grew Rosa Gallica officinalis, the beautiful red apothecary's rose, and the amazing striped Rosa Mundi, In medieval paintings, we often see Mary depicted in a garden, completely surrounded or contained by roses. I wanted to find out how a flower that had been a pagan symbol of profane love and sensuality could have become a symbol of the purity of the Virgin Mary. The extraordinary thing is, although tradition tells us that uh, you know all so-called pagan symbols were dropped immediately in the Christian period, as soon as you start probing into these things more detail, in more detail, you find within literally two or three centuries of Christianity, we find the rose being used to symbolise Christ, being used to symbolise his passion, being used to symbolise purity, being used to symbolise immortality because of the longevity of the smell of the petals and so forth. It's quite extraordinary how fast it, it actually enters in. So the rose is for martyrs, and from that time on, the rose became associated with saints who had died for their faith, which is why rose petals were said to be found, or roses in bloom, were said to be found inside the tomb of any saint that was opened up. I mean, these are apocryphal legends, no doubt. And from that grew the habit of planting rose bushes on graves. A rose bush on a grave led me to the next stage in my quest. I was on my way to a Suffolk country churchyard, but the rose I was seeking came from Persia, and everything I had been told about it seemed out of place in this very English setting. The Avesta, which is the earliest sacred book of Persian times, mentions the rose. There were two angels of Ormaz that were associated with the rose. One was the angel Din, who was associated with a hundred petal rose, and the other was the angel Rashnu, who was associated with the dog rose. 
The hundred petal rose couldn't have been Rosa centifolia. It wasn't around then. They must have been referring to some other very fully petaled rose. The Arabs themselves were fascinated by the rose, and the rose was used in their literature, it was associated with Muhammad, it crept into the Persian literature. Most of the Persian poets were Sufis, and the Sufis used the rose as a symbol for trying to attain Godhead, because the rose was the symbol of perfection, and the Sufis were always striving to achieve perfection. I had found the grave of Edward Fitzgerald, translator of the famous 12th century Persian poem, The Rubiat of Omar Khayyam, which celebrated life, love, and appropriately, the rose. Seed brought by William Simpson, artist, traveler, from the grave of Omar Khayyam, Naishapur, planted by the Omar Khayyam Club, 7th of October, 1893. William Simpson was the artist illustrator of the Illustrated London News. And in 1883, he was traveling in Afghanistan and he suddenly remembered that he was quite near where Omar Khayyam was said to have come from. And he also remembered that Omar Khayyam was reputed to have said to one of his students, I hope that I will be buried on a spot where the north wind would scatter roses over it. So he um, decided to go in search of Omar Khayyam's tomb and he went to Nishapur and just outside it he did find that there was Omar Khayyam's tomb and there were rose blossoms Wonderful. on it. Yeah. And so he collected some of these hips and he sent them to Kew where they were grafted onto a rose of lusty English stock, according, according to Simpson. And then um, the Omar Khayyam Club, which had been started in 1892, decided that it would be a great idea to um, plant this rose on Fitzgerald's tomb. So in 1893, a little group of members of the Omar Khayyam Club came down to the graveyard at Bourges and um, had a little planting ceremony at which a number of poems were read, including a lovely one by Edmund Goss. Rain here, triumphant rose from Omar's grave, born by a dervish o'er the Persian wave, Reign with fresh pride, since here a heart is sleeping, that double glory to your master gave. From 12th century Persian mysteries, my next stop was to be 18th century France, where in the aftermath of the French Revolution came a revolution in rose breeding. And that quest continues next Thursday here on BBC Two, again at 8.30.